Okay. So welcome everybody. This is already the, the last lecture of the, the summer school. So today we have with us uh, Nicolas Buma from, uh, from EPFL. So he's an assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics at EPFL, where he holds the, the chair in continuous optimization. So most of his work is uh, centered around numerical analysis, statistical estimation, and as you will see, probably most of it today about around optimization of manifolds. Now, if you, if you look back at the, the previous lectures, actually all of them, there was only one topic which was in every talk we have seen, which is optimization. And on top of that, you also saw that most of the, the lectures pointed out that it was quite complicated to extend theories beyond linear stuff or whatever. And you will see that probably today that there is one particularly nice uh, setting where you can, in fact, extend things nicely beyond uh, linear settings, which is on, on manifold. So before uh, joining EPFL, uh, Nicola, he holds um, uh, academic positions at Princeton, uh, before that at, at Imbria, and he did his PhD in uh, Levin, I should say that correctly. So um, yeah, I, th I think you'll be in for a very nice uh, treat today. And um, yeah, so the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, thank you for, uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to, to speak in this, uh, in this very nice summer school with a great program. Uh, and the, the introduction is, uh, is exactly right. So uh, I'll talk about optimization. This will be a um, somewhat technical lecture, although I suppose uh, you, know, you will be the judge, uh, the judge of that. Uh, because it's going to be about optimization specifically on, on manifolds. And uh, manifolds are defined uh, in uh, you know, a general mathematical theory of uh, differential geometry. And in fact, we're going to need a little bit more than that. Uh, specifically, we're going to need some very basic elements of Riemannian geometry. And now differential geometry and Riemannian geometry are not usually part of uh, the, uh, the curriculum in uh, certainly in engineering schools. And I think even for most uh, applied math uh, programs, uh, certainly it was not the case when I was in school. And so um, what I'd like to do today is sort of give you the, the framework where these mathematical tools come up for optimization in applications, although I'll be brief on that side. And then uh, what I hope is in the you know, two hours or so that we have together to give you a crash course in just the, the, the basic elements of differential geometry and Riemannian geometry that, that you need so that you can you know, um, look into the literature on those topics and, and, uh, and uh, hopefully even uh, participate uh, in, this, uh, in this field. So that's the, that's the plan, uh, the hope uh, for today. And in order to um, make uh, this, this jump, I want to first uh, bring us back all the way back to uh, step zero in optimization, uh, which is when you're looking at an optimization problem, you want to you know, optimize something, what you're given, or maybe what comes out of the modeling part uh, that you did, are very, very simple mathematical object with you know, barely any structure at all. Namely, you have a set, I'll call it the set S, it's your search space, your feasible set, that's your you know, area to explore. And then you have a real valued function f defined on that set, just assigns a real number to each element of the set. And optimization is just uh, the task of finding an element of the set where f of x is as small as possible. All right, but these sets, functions, they're arguably some of the most basic elements of uh, mathematics. And this is all you need to define uh, the problem. But then of course, uh, what we're used to on the, you know, on the algorithmic side, is that you never face such a problem head on with just those basic structures. What you usually want to do is to add some structure, identify or add some structure to that set F, to that function F in such a way that you know, this will help you design and analyze, implement algorithms that hopefully will be uh, more efficient uh, for the task at hand. But it's important, or at least I think it's important, I wanna highlight this, to uh, realize that that structure is not part of the problem specification. It's something we add for algorith algorithmic purposes, okay? And the first example, and this is going to connect directly to uh, Steve Wright's uh, presentation from yesterday. Uh, the first example is what people call unconstrained optimization, where your search space uh, is a linear space. So for example, it could be Rn, it could be a set of matrices, a set of you know, symmetric matrices, why not? But it's a linear space. And if you're trying to minimize a function over a linear space, then something very nice that you can do by adding a structure to that linearity is to turn the linear space into a Euclidean space, uh, essentially just de de defining an inner product on the linear space. So for example, for Rn, the typical inner product would just be 
you know, uh, U transpose V for two vectors U and V in RM, sum of UI, VI. Right? That's one way that you can turn RM into a Euclidean space. There are other ways. And why would you want to do that specifically in the context of optimization? Well, uh, if your function F is differentiable in the usual sense that we learn in multivariate calculus, then we know, and you have a reminder at the bottom right, then we know that as soon as we have an inner product, we can define the notion of gradient of a function. And if it's sufficiently differentiable, you can even define the notion of Hessian of a function. So the gradient is a vector field and it, it is defined through the inner product. For the particular case of inner product that I have here on the screen, you would recover the usual notion that the gradient is the vector of all the partial derivatives of F, right? With all of the, the variables X1, X2, X3. But more generally, if you have some inner product, this will induce some notion of gradient. And then that's a vector field and the Hessian is the, the derivative of that vector field. Okay, why is this useful for optimization? Well, because you can use gradients to design uh, algorithms such as the gradient descent method. You can use the Hessian uh, on top of that to design uh, Newton's method and then all sorts of variations and refinements uh, of those concepts. All right, so you just had linearity, you add some special structure on it this gives you additional tools and properties and structure, and then you can use that to design algorithms. Okay. Now, to the heart of the matter for, uh, for today, or at least for, for my part today, is you might at some point, and I'll show some examples, uh, face an optimization problem where the, the search space S is not a linear space, or at least not necessarily a linear space, but it's going to be a, a more general, it's going to be part of a more general class of sets, uh, which are called smooth manifolds. Okay, we'll go in multiple stages uh, you know, into the, the business of defining exactly what that means. But for now, just picture a sphere if you're not too familiar with, with the concept. So just a, a nice sphere, just the, the shell, all right? Not the whole bowl, just the, uh, the surface that defines the sphere. Um, I'll call this a smooth manifold. Intuitively, it makes sense to say that the sphere is smooth, all right? Uh, we'll see what that means. And you could, this happens, uh, have an optimization problem where the search space is such a smooth set, right? I'll call it M, and your function F assigns a real number to each point uh, on, the, on the smooth set. And then you might ask, okay, when that's the structure I start with, um, can I somehow add perhaps some structure on top of it to allow for the development of nice algorithms? It's a natural question to ask. And uh, the answer here will be, you know, echoing the thing where we added a Euclidean structure by defining an inner product on our end, you can now also add some structure on a smooth manifold, turning it, turning it into a Riemannian manifold. We'll talk about what that means. It's also going to be, um, you know, um, at the heart of it, it's also going to be about defining inner products, but not on the set itself because the set is not linear. Okay, but we're going to turn the manifold into a Riemannian manifold. And why would we do that? Well, you can guess it. It's because as soon as you do this, then mathematically, you have a very nice, elegant, clean way of defining something that you know, will be called Riemannian gradients for the functions and Riemannian Hessians uh, for the functions. And once you have those objects, then you can design algorithms that will be the Riemannian equivalents of gradient descent, of Newton's method, and you know, all of the refinements and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so that, that's the idea, that's the, uh, where I want to go. And just you know, to give you a sense of perspective, this idea that you can optimize on Riemannian manifolds courtesy of the fact you know, that mathematics will provide for you a notion of gradient and Hessian on Riemannian manifolds in general. This idea will, be, will turn 50 next year, actually. Uh, there's a paper from 1972 by Lewenberger uh, at Stanford who you know, imagined that this uh, should be doable in theory, at least, and he you know, described this to some length but it wasn't really perceived as something practical to do. And then somewhat later, uh, I would say in the 90s, um, those algorithms actually gained uh, some traction and, and a lot more today, uh, even more. Um, sort of when, when people um, you know, focused on the, the fact that while you can define all of these tools on general manifolds, and it's very nice to do so, and you should, because you can derive the whole theory in general, uh, in practice, the manifolds that come up in applications and that, that are you know, nice enough to work with and useful enough that you actually want to, they tend to be matrix manifolds. And what I mean by that is that the manifold will be a set, of course, but the points in that set will be matrices. 
And then the geometric operations that we need to work with these matrices are going to be, well, fundamentally numerical linear algebra tools. And in the 90s, the, the crowd of numerical linear algebraists, or I don't know how I should call them, numerical analysts, got really interested in this and said, look, you can, you know, you can actually work with this and, and robustly, efficiently on a computer, and then you can do all of those things. And, um, and uh, you know, in my view, at least, uh, things sort of started from there, right? But these ideas have been around for, for a bit and they're uh, coming into fashion again because they, they come up in, in modern applications. All right. So first take on what is a manifold? Well, let's do a definition by pictures. Uh, this uh, you know, will not bring us very far, but hopefully it will convey some idea, uh, which is the two images at the top. Uh, these are Wolfram, uh, Wolfram Alpha uh, images. Um, the two images at the top uh, are manifolds, embedded submanifolds of R3. We'll get into the specifics of that. Why? Well, intuitively, because around each point on those surfaces, you can quite easily imagine that you could approximate the surface locally with a linear space, with a linear plane, all right, a, a subspace of dimension two. Uh, this you can do at every point of uh, that sphere and that uh, hyperboloid of sorts, okay? And, and this uh, we're going to consider a smooth set because of that idea that you can linearize it in a meaningful way. Uh, as a counterexample to that, you see the picture at the bottom, uh, this we would say is not uh, a smooth submanifold of R3. Why not? Well, you see that uh, there are these kinks here where the, where the surface sort of, um, you know, wraps back on itself. And so here you have the straight angle, uh, the sharp angle uh, at the crossing point. And because of this here, if you were trying to approximate what the surface looks like around that point here on the edge with one linear space of dimension two, um, you, you know, this would be difficult to do in a meaningful way uh, because it's not so clear which, which plane you should pick. Okay, so that's the first picture, uh, this first idea of, okay, what is a manifold, all right? Now, what I wanna do going forward now, just to give you a heads up, is we're going to take a second take at defining manifolds, this one uh, by examples, uh, but more useful examples. So I want to look at examples of matrix manifolds that come up in applications, all right, that's one. And then after we're done with this, I will start the, uh, the, the main part uh, of, uh, of these uh, lectures, uh, which is looking at the formal definition of uh, manifolds in a restricted but uh, relevant sense. Um, and then to build a collection of mathematical tools to work on manifolds. Okay, and then, then we'll get into algorithms and I'll say a few more words about um, you know, research and, and, and other things. Um, but for now, uh, what I'd like to do is for us to, you know, learn what a manifold is. And for this, let's start with some examples that hopefully will also double as a motivation uh, for you know, why one might care about this. All right, so take two. What are some manifolds that come up in the wild? Uh, and they're going to be matrix manifolds, so sets whose elements are matrices. Well, there are two exceptions, although uh, we can talk more about that. All right. Okay, and, and by the way, um, if you, know, you have any questions, uh, don't uh, hesitate to, to you know, interrupt. Uh, I cannot see messages uh, on the screen if you just post in the chat, uh, but uh, if someone wants to just uh, interrupt me, that's uh, perfectly fine. Okay, so some examples. I just have three slides with examples here. Um, the first and perhaps the, um, perhaps the most common uh, example in applications is the Stiefel manifold. So here, your set M, is a set of matrices of size n by p. And here you, th you should think of p as being smaller than n. So the, the matrices have this kind of shape, right? They're, they're tall and narrow. And the property that we require of those matrices so that they are in the set M uh, is that their columns should be orthonormal um, you know, with respect to each other uh, and with respect to the standard inner product. So a concise way of expressing that is to say that x transpose x is equal to a small identity matrix of size p by p. Okay, so the set of such matrices that are orthonormal frames, if you will, uh, they form a, a set which is called the Stiefel manifold and it's a smooth uh, submanifold of the matrices of size n by p. Okay, so this comes up quite a bit in applications. Uh, one of them is in a principal component analysis, all right? 
And uh, in particular, what you could imagine doing is write down a, a cost function, so a function, a real valued function on the Stiefel manifold, which for some given data set will tell you, you know, whether some candidate matrix X, so candidate principal components, A, are a good fit for your data. Do they actually capture, um, you know, some low dimensionality uh, uh, trend in your data? But also maybe you might want to say, I prefer matrices on the Stiefel manifold that contain a lot of zeros. Why? Because then the columns of the matrix X would be sparse. And that might be nice for interpretation uh, if you are using PCA in a statistical setting. Okay, so that would be sparse PCA. That would be one way that optimization on the Stiefel manifold might come up. All right. Now, another example, which is very much related to the Stiefel manifold is the rotation group. So if you consider the set of matrices, let's say of size three by three, but it could be of size D by D, it doesn't matter. Uh, that are orthogonal. So they're square and X transpose X is the identity. So they're orthogonal matrices. Now we know that geometrically, uh, an orthogonal matrix represents a rotation and also possibly a reflection uh, of R3 in this case, right? It's a linear operation that corresponds to a rotation of the space and possibly also to a reflection of the space. Um, and you can rule out reflections if you add the, condi the condition that you only want those matrices whose determinant is plus one. All of the other orthogonal matrices have determinant negative one and that corresponds to a reflection, but I just want those with a uh, determinant equal to plus one. Now the set of such matrices uh, is, I claim, a smooth sub-manifold of uh, the three by three matrices. Okay, it's a subset in there and it's smooth. It doesn't have any kinks. Uh, and each matrix in there is in one-to-one, -one, I mean, those matrices are in one-to-one -one correspondence with all the possible orientations of objects in 3D or equivalently of all the possible rotations of one object from one orientation to another orientation. Okay, now you can probably imagine how this would come up um, possibly in a control, uh, in control problem, uh, also in robotics problems and uh, computer vision problems where there are certain objects they could be robots, they could be objects that the robot sees, and you'd like to estimate what is the orientation of those objects in the physical world. You might have some sensors, some data, and based on this, those data, you might set up a cost function, a loss function, and you know, a regression function, whatever you want, you want to call it, where the unknown is a rotation, or maybe many rotations, and the function checks you know, how well the data agrees with your proposed rotations. And then to find the best possible orientations would be an optimization problem on that manifold. Okay, so this, this is one way that those uh, objects uh, can come up, right? And I'm just claiming right now that they are indeed smooth manifolds, okay? Another uh, pair of examples um, would be the Grassman manifold. This is also quite common in applications. Now, this one is a bit uh, more abstract, although you can make it concrete. Now the Grassmann manifold is a set and a point in that set is in fact a linear subspace. Specifically, picture Rn and now picture a subspace of smaller dimension D in Rn, right? You'll get some plane in R3, for example, fix N in D. Now that subspace, that whole subspace, we will consider that this is one point in the Grassmann manifold. And now the set of all of these subspaces together, they form the Grassmann manifold. Right now, this is a bit more abstract, uh, but I claim uh, that this is also a smooth manifold. And one way that you can think of it as a uh, matrix manifold is as follows. You can say, okay, if I have a subspace in Rn, then it's possible to orthogonally project things from Rn to that subspace. The orthogonal projector that you know would encode that operation is a matrix, and that matrix satisfies certain conditions that express the fact that it is an orthogonal projector. Now, the set of orthogonal projectors is a set of matrices, and it will be one to one with the subspaces. Uh, and what I claim really is that that set of projectors is a smooth manifold. All right, in the sense that we'll, we'll make precise later on. Uh, another example 
is uh, the set of matrices of a certain fixed size and fixed rank. Uh, that set, as it turns out, is also a smooth manifold uh, in the set of matrices of size m by n. And, and again, these things come up uh, in a number of applications, notably in applications from, uh, let's say, data science to be, uh, to be you know, very broad and, and uh, non-committal. Okay, so these are two other examples of sets on which you might want to optimize and their manifolds. And our last uh, slide of examples, uh, manifolds that might come up. I'll say very little about those, uh, but they're interesting for other respects, but this would be a topic for a different, you know, a different lecture. Um, the set of positive definite matrices, so symmetric matrices that are positive definite, uh, this is also a manifold. Okay, when might it happen that you need to optimize over positive definite matrices? Well, um, in metric learning, this comes up because all inner products in linear spaces are encoded, can be encoded in a positive definite matrix. So if you're trying to find the best possible inner product over some space to you know, capture some aspects of the data, then you actually have an optimization problem over the positive definite matrices. That's one example. Uh, another example would be in Gaussian mixture models. If you're trying to model the distribution of uh, a data set as being you know, a mixture of Gaussians, then what do you need to parameterize a Gaussian? Well, you need the center and you need its covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix uh, might be a positive definite matrix. It might not be, you know, it might only be semi-definite, but in general, generically, it would be positive definite. So if you're trying to find the best Gaussian mixture to fit some data set, then you have an optimization problem over the positive definite matrices in particular. Okay, and there's another one, which is the one you actually see in the drawing here, which is uh, the hyperbolic space, um, which is you know, this hyperboloid uh, that we see here. Now, those manifolds, they are primarily interesting when you endow them with a very special Riemannian metric that will turn them into Hadamard manifolds. And so their intrinsic curvature will be negative. I'm not going to say anything more about that today. I just wanted to mention that idea that those particular sets if you endow them with a particular metric, and they're very well known, very well understood, um, then they will have negative or at least non-positive intrinsic curvature. And this makes those manifolds, those sets, particularly comfortable and interesting to study a generalization of convexity, which is called geodesic convexity. And if you know anything about convex optimization, then you know that it's the nicest thing ever. And so surely it, you know, it would be nice to have convexity on manifolds as well. And, for those cases, you can certainly uh, have that. Because okay, so I just wanted to, to mention uh, those as well. All right, so that was three slides, uh, six examples of manifolds that come up in applications. And so, you know, hopefully you're with me and, and motivated to, to learn um, how might we actually go about optimizing over those manifolds. And for this, uh, you, won't be, you will not be surprised, I'm sure, uh, to know that well, what we need is some basic tools, some basic elements from differential geometry, first and foremost, and then also just a little bit, a dash of Riemannian geometry. Okay, and that's what we're going to go uh, into now for most of the remaining time. Um, and then we'll, we'll go back to, um, you know, to, to broader topics at the end, sort of uh, revolve back to optimization. But for now, let's just talk a bit um, about geometry. Maybe this is a good time for me to see if there are any, any uh, questions, just in case and we can discuss anything. All right, very good. Okay, now we're going to get into the technical part. So hopefully I'm also going to speak a bit slower, uh, but let me know, interrupt at any point. Um, we're just going to get into the thick of it. And well, there will not be, unfortunately, enough uh, time or room to you know, do any proofs of anything. So I will claim certain things. A lot of the, a lot of the things that I will claim <clears throat> are actually not difficult exercises. Uh, and I'll try to point it out when that's the case. And maybe you want to go back and revisit this after the, the lecture at some point. Uh, some of the things are a bit harder to prove by, by you know, sort of uh, by oneself, but, you know, everything uh, can be done. All right. So let's take a third stab 
at defining what is a manifold. Okay, and this time more technical, um, but hopefully also more illuminating than just a bunch of examples. I should tell you uh, that we're, we're not actually going to look at the general definition of a manifold. Uh, this would take a very long time. Um, if you're interested, pick up just any book about differential geometry, probably on, you know, in section number one, that's uh, where you will find the definition. It's based on atlases, on charts and atlases and whatnot. Um, we're not going to go there. We're going to uh, focus on a special case that is in fact sufficient to understand all of the examples that I mentioned uh, previously, which is a special case of a manifold which is embedded in a linear space. Uh, and this is called a smooth embedded submanifold. In our case, all of the manifolds I mentioned are somehow or another uh, matrix manifolds. So they are subsets of a linear space of matrices. And so everything fits in this scenario. All right, so you pick a subset M of some linear space E of dimension D. Okay, so E could be a set of matrices. All right, a linear space of matrices. Now, the subset M, uh, it could be the circle that we see on the screen here at the bottom, and E could be R2 in this case. We're going to say that the subset is a smooth embedded submanifold of some dimension, let's say N, if the following happens. Now, uh, this definition is, definition is not too long, but let's just follow along on the, on the drawing, okay? And, and uh, fo follow me in the construction of it as we add things to the drawing at the bottom here. What I'm trying to express is I'm trying to capture the idea that the set is smooth. Now, what might that mean? What we're going to try to capture is the idea that locally, the set can be deformed in some nice enough way up until the point where it becomes linear. If you can do that, if you can deform your set nicely until it becomes linear, then we're, and you can do this around every point locally, then we will say that the set is, is uh, smooth. Okay, so how does that work uh, more precisely? What I want is for each point X on the manifold, I would like for it to be possible to find a neighborhood of X, so some open set in E, in R2 in this case, that contains X. And I also want that, you know, together with this uh, neighborhood U, this open set, I also want to find a map C to RD. Remember, D is the dimension of E, okay? So they're two dimensional in both cases here. I want to find a map C. This map C is going to deform the open set U into some open set V. So C of U is some open set V. In particular, since X is in U, C of X is in V, all right? I want this map to be smooth in the usual sense of what it means for a function to be smooth between open sets of linear spaces. So C infinity, infinitely differentiable. I want C to be smooth. I want C to be invertible. And I want the inverse to be smooth as well. Uh, this is called a diffeomorphism. Okay, so C should be a very nice map. You can go back and forth and it's completely smooth. Now that's not all. The important next ingredient that I want is that you see here, because X is on the manifold, and U, well, on the set anyway, and U is a neighborhood of X, then certainly U contains a patch of M. There's a little bit of M that is included in U. Now, when I apply C to everything in here, some part of V here will be the image of the intersection of M with U. So U intersection M, when I push it through C, something will happen to it. It's going to be included in V, of course. And specifically, what I want is for that image, that patch to become flat. All right. Now, if you can do that, find such a neighborhood and such a map around every point X of the set M, then we will say that your set is smooth. Okay. And it kind of makes sense uh, why the definition would, would say that. Perhaps it makes even more sense if we see a, a counterexample. So what would be a set that fails this test? And it's a nice exercise. It's not necessarily easy, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, to try to show that for this set, the cross, 
if you center yourself around the, the crossing point, which is you know the point where things do not look smooth, actually, there's a kink, uh, it's a nice exercise to try to show that it's impossible to find you know, such a psi and neighborhood and blah, blah, blah. Okay, and so this set would fail the definition. It's not a smooth set. All right, that's the definition of a smooth embedded submanifold of dimension n uh, in, a, in a subspace uh, uh, d. Um, so the dimension n here would be the dimension of that linear bit. Okay, and in this case, it's dimension one. So the circle has dimension one. Just to add a little bit of nomenclature to this, the embedding space, in this case, R2, that's, well, so E is what we call the embedding space. So the linear space in which the set is, that's, I will refer to that as the embedding space. That's what the manifold is embedded in. All right, so that's the definition. We're not actually going to need the specifics of that definition going forward, yeah, but I think it's good to, to have a precise idea uh, of what this is about. All right, a few quick facts. Uh, and in fact, uh, those facts are probably more useful in the practice of optimization on the manifolds than the definition of a manifold, which is one, all of these examples I mentioned before, I mean, of course, I already told you they are manifolds, okay? Um, also, and this is quite clear from the definition, in fact, linear subspaces themselves are manifolds. So any algorithms, any analysis, any theory, any tools you have for optimization on manifolds also applies for what people call unconstrained optimization, optimization in, in linear spaces, which is nice. Open sets of manifolds are manifolds. By the way, if you combine those two items, linear subspaces and open sets, you can immediately see why positive definite matrices form a manifold, right? Positive definite matrices form an open subset of the symmetric matrices. And so they're a manifold. And finally, and this is very useful in practice, products of manifolds are manifolds. Right now I'm bringing all of this up because usually the way you would recognize in an application that, you know, oh, this is optimization on a manifold is because you would happen to know a whole bunch of manifolds. And then you would realize that, oh, you know, this is a so-and-so combination of those basic blocks that I happen to know are manifolds. All right. Now, why do we care so much about manifolds? What's so nice about them? Well, the nicest, nicest thing about them is that uh, they can be meaningfully linearized around each point. OK, so what we're about to do now is to define a notion of tangent space to uh, a manifold, to an embedded submanifold of a linear space. And the tangent space to a manifold at some point will be the set of tangent vectors. And so let's go ahead and, and define, you know, what is a tangent vector? Uh, there's a very nice intrinsic way of doing that, which is the definition we see here at the top of the screen. Uh, and here's how it goes. Um, what are we trying to capture? We're trying to define, you know, a notion of tangent vector. What are we trying to achieve? Well, a tangent vector should somehow capture the idea that if I have a point X on the manifold, and I move away along a direction that we're going to call a tangent vector. So I really move along that direction. Now, chances are I'm going to leave the manifold if I do that, right? Because usually manifolds are nonlinear, or let's say the interesting manifolds are not linear. So if I move in a straight line, chances are I'm going to leave the manifold. But along certain directions, I'm going to stay very close to the manifold at first. So for example, if you, you know, look at the sphere here, if I move away from X, along a direction that is you know, orthogonal to X, then I'm going to stay very close to the sphere at first. In contrast, if I move away from X along the direction X, radially away from the sphere, then I'm going to you know, be very far from the manifold immediately. Okay, so certain directions will keep me close to the manifold at first. And that's what we're trying to capture. And one way to do that is to consider curves on the manifold that pass through the point X. All right, so curves C of T traces out a curve on the manifold. C of T passes through the point X at T equals zero. That's you know, just for as a convention. Okay. Now, if that curve has a velocity at T equals zero, if it's differentiable at T equals zero, you know, differentiable in the embedding linear space. So if this limit exists, then that limit corresponds to a certain vector, let's call it V. That vector, we're going to call that a tangent vector. And you could easily show 
um, if you're not already convinced from the drawing, that indeed, if you move away from X and along that straight direction V, then you're actually going to stay quite close to the manifold. Why? Well, because you stay quite close to the curve C of T and the curve C of T is on the manifold. So, you know, you kind of have to be close to the manifold. So that's how we define tangent vectors. Consider all the curves that pass through X with some velocity, collect all of those velocities. That's what we call the tangent space, the set of all tangent vectors. Now, something that is not obvious, but I'm claiming is true for a manifold, and that's why they're important, is that the set of all tangent vectors is itself a linear space. It is a linear subspace of E. Not only that, but they all have the same dimension. And that dimension is what we call the dimension of the manifold. All right, so for example, for the sphere here, you can see that at each point X, you can linearize the sphere with the tangent space, which is going to be a two-dimensional linear space. And all of the tangent spaces have two dimensions. And so we'll say that the sphere has the dimension two. All right. So I hope this makes sense. That's the notion of tangent space. All right. Now, in practice, uh, when you're optimizing on a manifold, you have to work with tangent vectors all the time. And it's not the case in general, I mean, in, in actuality, that you would describe tangent vectors by figuring out curves. Sometimes it is convenient, but more often what is convenient is to do the following, is if your manifold is given to you, is described to you as a solution set of some nonlinear equations or some linear equations, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if, it's, if it is described to you as a solution of some equations, for example, for Stiefel, the equation was X transpose X equals identity or X transpose X minus identity equals zero. It's a bunch of nonlinear equations that define the set. Okay. Now, if those defining equations satisfy certain conditions that you can read here, uh, and for those of you who are familiar with this, this is directly connected to the notion of uh, LICQ in KKT uh, theory, a linear independence constraint qualification. That's exactly the same thing. If that's the case, then, the tangent space will be exactly the kernel of the differential of those defining equations, right? So H defines the manifold, at least locally. If you differentiate H, you'll get a linear map. Its kernel will be a subspace of E. And under those conditions, that subspace is exactly uh, the tangent space, okay, that I, that I defined above. Um, and the main ingredient to prove that uh, this is not so easy, I should say. The main ingredient to prove that is the inverse function theorem, which uh, you may or may not have um, learned about in, in your multivariate calculus course. Okay, you have an example here for the sphere where using this mechanism, you can very easily figure out that the tangent space to the sphere at X is a set of vectors V that are you know, orthogonal to X with respect to the usual inner product. And that's not too shocking, all right? So we have manifolds. And we have tangent spaces, a means to linearize them. Okay, both of these things are going to be very useful, as you can imagine. Now, one more thing, one more tool that we're going to use and, uh, and you know, keep using is the notion of smooth maps, so smooth functions on manifolds and possibly to manifolds. Um, and so, you know, we should clarify what does it mean for a function? which is defined on a manifold or which takes values in a manifold to be smooth. What does that mean? Okay, a priori, the only thing that we define in a standard multivariate calculus course is what it means for a function between two open sets of linear spaces to be smooth, to be C infinity, right? Now, can we extend that definition somehow um, to make sense of smoothness for a function F, a map F, which is defined on some manifold M, and which takes values in some manifold M prime. All right, now M is, we're going to say, embedded in a linear space E, and M prime is embedded in a linear space E prime. Okay. What we're going to say is that the map F is smooth if it has a smooth extension. And what that means is if you can find a map F bar, which is defined on a little bit more than just the manifold. So M is embedded in E, 
Now, what I want is to find some open set U which contains M, so a neighborhood of M in E, and a map F bar from U to E prime. So F bar, notice, is going from some open set of a linear space to a linear space. It makes sense to say that F bar is smooth using standard notions. And what I want is to find a smooth F bar like that, which when I restrict it to the manifold M is equal to F. If you can do that, if you can match this guy, then we will say that F is smooth. All right, let's look at the drawing. For a particular case, if I have a cost function on a manifold, what does it mean that the cost function is smooth? Well, if you can find a function F bar, the real valued function F bar, which is defined not just on, in this case, the circle, but on some neighborhood of the circle. And F bar is smooth in the usual sense for a function on you know, an open set in R2. And when you restrict F bar to the circle, when you only care about what happens on the circle, you get exactly the same thing as F, then we say that F is smooth. Now, something I want to highlight here from the practical point of view is that when you actually face an optimization problem on a manifold, formally, mathematically, the cost function indeed is this function f defined on the manifold, okay? And that's the object that you should focus on mathematically. But in actuality, if your manifold is a subset of matrices, very often, the cost function that you write down on paper um, is actually defined over all the matrices in the embedding space. It's just that formally you only care uh, and maybe the, the function only makes sense when, it's, when you look at what happens on the manifold, but, but it's presumably, and, and most often that's the case, defined outside of the manifold as well. So what I'm saying is in practice, in practice, you would actually be given or you, know, you would have F bar or this F bar as well. Okay, and then formally you would say, let's go ahead and restrict F bar to the manifold. This will give you your mathematical object. And then if that's the case, to assess smoothness is very easy. Just check if your F bar is smooth. Okay, if it is smooth, then you're good. If it's not smooth, well, you can't quite conclude, but presumably, you know, uh, things will be okay. All right, so hopefully this makes sense. Uh, notion of smooth maps and manifolds. And something I want to highlight here, because this is uh, useful to know uh, in practice, is if you have a map that goes from one manifold to another, and then you have another map that goes from that manifold to yet another manifold. And let's say that both of these maps are smooth, okay? Then the composition of those two maps is also smooth. Okay, which not, not exactly shocking, uh, but it's good that we have that. All right, so we have smooth manifolds, we have tangent spaces, we have smooth maps on manifolds. Now it's very, very tempting to go ahead and differentiate them, right? The whole point of having a smooth map is that you can have a differential for it. And the differential is supposed to inform you about the local behavior of those maps. So how can we define the differential of a smooth map between manifolds? Right? This is quite a, it's an interesting uh, uh, question to tackle with the, the fresh definitions that we now have uh, at our, our disposal. Uh, and what I propose is that we first look at the drawing here at the bottom of the screen, and then we're going to use this to construct uh, the definition. It's not going to be too long, all right? So what's going on here? I have a map, F, goes from some manifold M to a possibly different, possibly the same manifold. Let's call it M prime in general, okay? Let's say it's a different manifold. Now, what I want is to understand locally, how does F behave around some point X on the manifold M? Okay, so pick a point X on a manifold. Of course, you can map, you can push X through F and you'll get a point on M prime, which is just F of X, all right? What I want is to understand if I push X a little bit along some tangent direction V, all right? Now X is going to move a little. So if I evaluate F at that you know, perturbed point, well, it's not going to be quite f of x anymore. f of x will also have moved a little bit. And what I want to understand if, is if I push x in the direction of v, what happens to f of x? In which direction does it move? After all, you know, that's what a differential is supposed to tell you exactly. All right. 
Now, how can we make sense of this while staying on the manifold, right? Because F formally, F is only defined on the manifold. So if I move away from X along the direction V, even if just a little bit, most likely I'm going to leave the manifold, all right? And then F is no longer defined there, which is a bit annoying. Now, what I can do instead is remember what is a tangent vector? Tangent vector at a point X is a vector which I can get as the velocity of some curve C of T that passes through X at T equals zero, for example, right? So if you pick any vector V, tangent vector V at X, you can find a curve on the manifold that passes through X with velocity V. Now this is nice because the curve is on M. So I can apply F to the whole curve. Okay, C of T is on M for all T. So F of C of T is well-defined for all T. And it's going to be a point on M prime for all T. Specifically, it's going to be a curve on M prime. And of course, that curve passes through, through F of X when T equals zero, right? Because C of zero is equal to X. So F of C of T, this composition, is a curve on M prime that passes through X with some velocity. That velocity, of course, is a tangent vector by definition, right? It's the velocity, it's a tangent vector at f of x. It's the velocity of a curve that passes through f of x. And that tangent vector captures exactly the notion of in which direction does f of x, f of x move when x moves in the direction v. And so that it's, is what we're going to call the differential of f at x along a tangent direction v is the velocity of that pushed curve, that composition f with c, okay, which formally is equal to that. The subtraction here is happening in the embedding space E prime. Something I want to highlight here, I mean, hopefully the, the intuition here makes sense. Um, and also hopefully you have some doubts about this definition, right? You look at this, uh, wait, oh, hold on. On the left-hand side here, V is some vector. And on the right-hand side, there's no V. There's just a curve. And the relationship between them is that the curve passes through X with velocity V, sure. But, but certainly there are many curves that pass through X with velocity V. So, you know, is it clear that I always get the same value for F composed with C prime at zero if I pick a different curve that has the right specifications? Okay, and the claim, and this is not an easy, uh, this is not a difficult exercise, is that yes, indeed, this is a good definition, right? So even if you pick another curve, as long as it satisfies this, you'll get the same conclusion. So the differential will be well-defined. That's one thing, it's well-defined. Not only that, but also, and this is again, not entirely obvious from the definition, this differential is actually linear in V. So it's a map that goes from the tangent space at X, which is a linear space, to the tangent space at F of X, which is also a linear space. And as a map between those two linear spaces, it is itself linear, okay? So that's another thing that is interesting to, to show. It's a nice exercise. And remember how if you have a smooth map from one manifold to another, and then another smooth map from that manifold to yet another, how if both maps are smooth, their composition is smooth. Well, the differential of the composition will obey a chain rule, which again is, is you know, salvaging something that you might intuitively want to have. And, and indeed, we, we have that. All right. Now, the last thing I will say about this, and then we'll have a, a break, um, is that usually, I mentioned this earlier, you're not really given a map between two manifolds. More often, you will actually be given a smooth extension for the map. And then you, know, you declare, I'm only interested in the value of that map on the manifold, the restriction. So you actually have F bar at your disposal, which is defined on more than a manifold, on a linear space. Um, and the really cool thing here, uh, the convenient thing, I should say, is that well, F bar is just defined on linear spaces or on open sets of linear spaces. So we know how to differentiate it in the usual sense, you know, how you compute the Jacobian of a map, really. Okay, we, we've done this for a, quite some time now. Now you can compute the Jacobian. And formally, this differential of F bar is defined on more than just the tangent space at X, because it's defined on more than the manifold. Um, the, the nice thing is that if you restrict that differential to the tangent space at X, 
then the operator you get, the linear map you get, is exactly this you know, geometrically defined differential. So in practice, when you need to differentiate something on a manifold, what you actually, well, on an embedded manifold anyway, what you actually do is you differentiate a smooth extension for it, which usually you have, and then formally you say, okay, but this only makes sense on the tangent space. Outside of the tangent space, things might start to depend on which smooth extension I picked, and this is you know, not a comfortable situation. But on a tangent space, you're good. Uh, everything is well-defined, all right? So I, I see, uh, yeah, it's, it's been roughly 50 minutes. I think this is a good time for a 10 minute break. Uh, so, you know, I'd be happy to continue, continue at three, but, but Walter, uh, I'm looking at you for, you That's know, great. Is, that, yeah. is that good? Yeah, absolutely. All right, fantastic. And uh, if you have uh, questions that come up during the break, then, you know, uh, let, let me know and, and we'll address them before uh, we, we continue. Okay, so I'll, I'll see, you, see you at 3 p.m. Uh, can I ask a question now? Sure, go ahead. Um, I would like to ask why would you require the manifold to be smooth? If you just want a derivative, a differentiable uh, manifold that would be enough, and you only require a differentiable uh, homeomorphism, right? So the question is, why do you require it to be a smooth map? Yes, okay. <clears throat> so, so it's true that you can, uh, so, so you're talking about the manifold specifically, or are you talking about the function f? Uh, manifold. About the manifold, yes. So it's true that you can uh, define less restrictive classes uh, of smooth sets that would not be C infinity, but just C1 or C2 or whatever you know happens to be necessary for your application. Um, now I'll say this about that. So you can certainly do that. Um, however, it makes all of the, the discussions uh, just a little bit more complicated. And so for this introduction, it's nicer not to. Uh, the other thing is I haven't really encountered uh, a, an interesting manifold in an application that is C1 or C2, but not C infinity. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are, it's just this hasn't really been a very important point for me so far, um, but certainly it's something you can do, yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll see you in a bit. Uh, Nicholas, I have a small question, are you ah, there? Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, you know, in, uh, like in classification problem, we assume that the images from one class is coming from one manifold, right? Most of the time it is one of the assumption. And if we add noise to this images, like uh, the set of images, then we say that, okay, now we have some kinks over this all manifold. So is there any way that we can bound somehow that uh, using a smooth manifold or then this uh, manifold is not like continuous as you said. Mm -hmm. So what should be the remedy at that point? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So, so I, I would say though, um, the, the word manifold is used very liberally in a lot of the uh, applied literature. And so when we say that, you know, the, the images uh, fall on a, on a low dimensional manifold, uh, that may be true in, in some uh, sense and, and maybe even in a precise sense, but it's probably not quite true in the sense that I defined uh, today in the C infinity sense, and maybe not even in the, the C1 uh, sense. Um, so, or, or at least not globally, it may be true local. So, so just one comment that I want to make is that in a lot of the literature, uh, the word manifold should sometimes be taken with a, you know, a little bit of a circum circumspection. Uh, that's one thing. Um, another thing then uh, may maybe closer to your, um, uh, to your question is there's a, um, there are two very different uh, disciplines here at play. One, and this is what I'm talking about today, is just uh, coming to you, uh, is um, optimization on a manifold where the manifold is, is known to you and it's fixed ahead of time and you know, you know all sorts of things about it. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and then there's another very interesting topic, which I think is closer to what you are mentioning, which is manifold learning in a sense, where you have some data that may or may not, and let's assume it does, uh, lie close to a manifold. Now that manifold is not known ahead of time. Its properties are maybe not so easy to, to grasp. And, and on top of that, the points may not be exactly on the manifold. They may just be close to it. And then the task there is more often to try to identify some kind of manifold or to somehow you know, handle it in some way, uh, but it's not necessarily to optimize on that manifold 
And maybe part of that is because we, well, it, it would be probably very difficult to do so because, you know, uh, we have very little, we have very indirect access to it. So, so there, there are different things uh, in my mind. Okay. So I, I, my question was like this, way, so that as you said that you have said, can we bound the like noisy many like noisy data with this you you set around the manifold that you said? So uh, can we do something like that in the case of classification problems, where you can have this kind of tube envelop around the manifold, and you said that the noisy uh, data will mm -hmm. be this one, and uh, in this set belong to this you set. Yes, I think I see what you're referring to. So, so it's this uh, notion of reach of a manifold, and, and you would have a like a, a tubular neighborhood of the embedded yes. manifold. Yes. Yes. And and I, and I assume that my uh, noisy images will lie in this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm I know um, people have and probably uh, are working on this, um, but I, I don't really have anything um, intelligent to to add uh, to that, unfortunately. Um, but, but it's certainly something that, that people are looking at. Well, I suppose as part of the effort of saying, okay, manifold learning is, is uh, difficult. So can we come up with some uh, assumptions that will make it uh, a bit easier? And, and one rather natural assumption then would be to say that, well, first of all, uh, your manifold is not too bendy in its embedding space. And that's a notion of extrinsic curvature. So you know, maybe it's, it's extrinsic curvature is somewhat bounded so that it has a, a positive reach and then if you assume that your data is in this tubular neighborhood where every point okay. has a closest point on the manifold and there's no ambiguity, you're not suddenly going to jump to some very distant part of it. Um, so, so this is certainly a natural assumption to have. And if you have that, then, then um, you can do a lot more. Uh, whether or not that's legitimate in applications, this I have no idea, but uh, you know, I'd have to yeah, um, yeah. look at the yeah, thank, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the comments. Yeah, that's, that's not just the question or you can say remark. Great, great, great. All right, so I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, then uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Okay, so what do we have so far? We have a linear space. Inside of, the, inside of that linear, linear space are some subsets. <clears throat> we understand what it means when, to say that that subset is smooth, a smooth embedded set manifold, all right? We understand that the really nice thing about being a smooth set is that you can linearize it. You have tangent spaces. Now, if you have a map that goes from one manifold to another, uh, we know what it means for that thing to be smooth, just if there's a smooth extension. And then we also know what it means for a smooth map between manifolds, well, to differentiate that map. And this is what we have on the screen here. Okay, and, and the practical take on it, uh, I mean, is just that, well, if you have a smooth extension, just differentiate the smooth extension and restrict it to the tangent space. But behind that practical take, there is a nice geometric picture in terms of curves and perturbations. Okay. Now, um, oh, da -da -da. yes. One more object that we need before we can go to uh, Riemannian manifolds, to Riemannian structures, is retractions. Now, retractions, are going to be uh, the tool that we use to move around the manifold. Okay, so just as a heads up for where this is going to come up, um, optimization algorithms already in Euclidean case, but really in, in any uh, situa interesting situation I can think of, optimization algorithms are iterative. You start at some point, call it x0, in our case on the manifold, and then you're going to create a point x1 and then a point x2, a point x3, et cetera, just a sequence of points in the hope that somehow that sequence will go somewhere interesting. Okay. Now, in our case, what that means is that we'll have a sequence of points on the manifold. And this means that we need the ability to jump from one point on the manifold to another point, hopefully by moving in some controlled direction. Okay, we wanna move away from xk to xk plus one, but, but we wanna be able to, you know, to say in which direction that we're supposed to move. Now that's what retractions will do for us, okay? And before we go to the formal definition, which is going to require a technical tool, okay, but it's all going to fit on this, on this slide. Uh, let's just look at uh, some natural examples. So for example, if I'm working with the sphere, okay, which is very convenient, I have a point here, x on the sphere, and there is a tangent vector v at x. Now, what I want is to move away from x along the direction v, but stay on the manifold. Now, what is a very natural thing to do for this? You know, just if you don't think about it too much, say, okay, 
I'm at x, add to it the tangent vector v, so x plus v. The result will, will not be on the sphere. That's true in general. But you can go back to the sphere just by normalizing, just by dividing by the Euclidean norm. OK? And this will give you a point on the manifold, which is which you can reach by moving away from x along the direction v. OK? So that's the kind of thing we're trying to capture but in, in a general sense. OK? And you have a more general picture over here. Now, what I described here, the special case, is part of a, an important family of retractions called metric projection, metric projection retractions. Um, so the way you build them is you say, okay, since I'm embedded in a linear space in general, I mean, in this particular but general case, you can compute x plus v. This is usually not going to be on the manifold, but you can ask, you know, what is the point of the manifold which is closest to x plus v, where closest to is uh, judged with respect to the Euclidean metric on the embedding Euclidean space. Okay, so this thing here, this is the closest point on the sphere to the point x plus v. Okay, so this is a, a metric projection retraction on the sphere. Uh, if your manifold is just a linear, linear space, then x plus v is your guy. Okay, compute x plus v. Oh, well, the manifold is linear, so this is actually is in the, in the manifold, so there's no projection needed. Okay, so it's nice to keep this in mind whenever you see a retraction and you want to you know, think about what happens in the linear case, we'll just replace by x plus v. Another example is if you're optimizing over the set of matrices of a certain rank, then, you know, x will be a matrix of that rank r. v will be some matrix, which is a tangent vector at x, okay, but it's a matrix. x plus v is some matrix whose rank usually is not r, usually it's going to be more than r, but then you can project back to the set of rank R matrices through a truncated SVD, right? And this is well known. And at least locally, if V is small enough, uh, this is well defined. Okay, so this is an example. Well, these are three examples of one class of retractions, but retractions are going to be more general than that. And in order for me to be able to define retractions, I'm going to need one more technical tool, which is called the tangent bundle. All right, now why is that before we go ahead and, and define it? Think about what a retraction is doing. You start with a point x and a tangent vector v at x. So you need both of these guys, x and v. And this is what you transform into some other point on the manifold. Okay, so the input of a retraction is a point and a tangent vector there. Now the tangent bundle is exactly the set of such pairs. So the tangent bundle of a manifold this is a set of all pairs x, v, where x is in the manifold, v is tangent at x. All right. Now, what is so special about the tangent bundle? Why do I need to introduce it? Well, notice that m is a subset of the, the embedding space, e, the linear space. Okay, so x is in e. The tangent space at x is a linear subspace of e. So v is also in e. All right, so x, v, that pair, belongs to the Cartesian product E times E. But e times E, that's a linear space. Now, what I claim, um, and it's not completely direct, is that the tangent bundle, in fact, of course, it's a subset of E times E, but more precisely, it's a smooth embedded submanifold of E times E. So the, the tangent bundle itself is smooth. That's convenient because a retraction is certainly going to be a map which goes from the tangent bundle to the manifold, right? Why? Because you give it as input a point and a tangent vector, and it's going to output a point on the manifold called Rxv, okay? Now, because the tangent bundle is a smooth manifold and M is a smooth manifold, now the retraction is a map from a manifold to another, and therefore, it makes sense to say, I want a retraction to be a smooth map from the tangent bundle to the manifold. Okay, and this is part of the definition. Why? Well, we're not going to go into any details of this, but effectively, um, you know, if you think about what optimization algorithms are doing, you're going to be somewhere on the manifold um, and you'll move along some tangent direction. You kind of want it to be the case that if your algorithm had landed you at the, another point very close by, 
and with a tangent vector that's kind of the same, that's retracting that very near, you know, that very similar eigenvector at the very similar base point would not land you in a completely different uh, region of the manifold, right? Because if that's the case, it's going to be very difficult to analyze algorithms. So we want the retractions to be somehow nice enough and let's just go with smooth. Okay, so the retraction is a smooth map from the tangent bundle to the manifold such that, well, if you give me a point X and V, of course I can retract the vector V and this will give me a point RXV, <clears throat> but I can also retract a scaled version of V scaled by some real parameter T. If I do that, then CFT will define a curve on the manifold, right? Because you're retracting tangent vectors and anything you retract will land you on the manifold. So for each value of T, you get a point on the manifold. Okay, so this here, this bit of a curve on the manifold, this here, this bit of a curve on the manifold, this is what you get when you retract TV for T varying from zero to one. And what we are requiring, that's the definition, is that any such curve that you create through the retraction should have the property that C of zero is equal to X. So if you retract the zero vector, you don't move. Okay, that kind of makes sense. But also, and this is where it all happens, the initial velocity of the curve should match V. So what we're saying is, if I am at a point X and I retract the vector V, I should land at some point RXV, which really you are reaching by moving away from X along some curve C of T, which at least at first is moving in the direction V. Okay, so this way, using a retraction, you'll be able to say, I'm at X, I wanna move in a direction V, let's just retract V. Okay, and at least in spirit, it's going in the right direction at first. What happens after, you know, is not part of the definition. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. That's the definition of retraction. Okay, all right. Now we have all that we're going to need from differential geometry up to one ingredient that we'll add in a moment, uh, vector fields, but we'll get to it. Um, and we're ready to add more structure to, remind, uh, to uh, smooth manifolds and namely a Riemannian structure. Okay, and remember the reason we're doing that is because we want gradients and, and hopefully also Hessians. And for this, we need some, something more. All right, now what's the idea? Well, at the very beginning of the lecture, um, you know, I mentioned how if you're optimizing on the, on the linear space, you can add structure to it and make it a Euclidean space by defining an inner product. Now, an inner product is something you define on the linear space, but manifolds in general are not linear. However, manifolds have tangent spaces and those are linear. Okay, so that's our way in. So the idea is consider any point X on a manifold. There's a tangent space there, TXM, that's linear. Define an inner product on that tangent space, okay? And now we're going to define an inner product on each tangent space. And because all of those tangent spaces are at least in principle different, um, I'm going to index all of these inner products with a, you know, a subscript X. So for each X on a manifold, uh, there's going to be an inner product defined on its tangent space, okay? Now, we're going to say that this collection of inner products, we're going to say that they form a Riemannian metric if they, the inner products, vary smoothly, which is something I need to define, we'll come back to this, with X. So intuitively, what is this, what is this saying? It's saying that if you have two points on your manifold and they're very close to one another, then their tangent spaces well, you know, they're not the same perhaps, but they're kind of, I mean, they're very similar. And what I want is for the inner products on those tangent spaces to also be kind of the same. Okay, but this is very loose. So we'll come back and define this, but that's the idea. We want the inner products to vary smoothly as a function of X. And if that's the case, if this collection of inner products that you picked has that property, then the manifold, the smooth manifold, together with that Riemannian metric, that choice of smoothly varying inner products, that together is what we call a Riemannian manifold. So it's the manifold together with those inner products. Right? Those things together, that's what we call the Riemannian manifold. 
Okay. Now we'll use this in a moment. What does it mean to be smoothly varying? <clears throat> well, um, we're going to define this right now, uh, but first uh, just a, an object uh, that is an easy object, but we're going to need right now. Let's define what it means, uh, what, what a vector field is on a manifold. Okay, what is a vector field in Rn? Well, it's, some, it's a map on Rn, which to each point of Rn associates a vector in Rn. Okay, that's a vector field. What's a vector field on a manifold? Well, it's a map on the manifold, which to each point of the manifold associates a tangent vector. So an element of the tangent bundle, but specifically a tangent vector at X. Right, so V of X is tangent vector at X, that's a vector field. Now, since M is a manifold and the tangent bundle is a manifold, it makes sense to say that the vector field is or is not smooth. Okay, you can have a notion of a smooth vector field. And this is what we're going to use to precisely define what do we mean when we say the inner products vary smoothly with X? Well, what we mean is exactly this. We say that the inner products very smoothly, they form a Riemannian metric if whenever you pick two smooth vector fields, U and V, this real function is smooth. All right, now let, let's parse this for a second. U and V are vector fields, vector fields. So at any point X, U of X is a tangent vector at X and V of X is a tangent vector at X, All right? So at each point x, I have two tangent vectors, u of x, v of x. I can take their inner product using the inner product at x. That will give me a real number at each point x. Right, so I have two vector fields. Using the collection of inner products, I can transform them into a real function on the manifold. And I can ask, is that function smooth, yes or no? And uh, what we say is that the inner products vary smoothly. If provided the uh, vector fields themselves are smooth, then those real functions are smooth. If you have that, we'll say the form of Riemannian metric together with a manifold, that's a Riemannian manifold. And that's it, All right? That's what a Riemannian manifold is, okay. Now, you know, it's a bit abstract. We'll make it more concrete in a second by looking, looking at an example. But before particularizing, I just wanna you know, take a step back and think again about you know, these comments I made at the very beginning of the, of the lecture, which is about the role of structure and optimization. And, and at which point does, it, does the optimization problem start? And at, which, at which point does the alg algorithmic, uh, algorithm designer's job start? You know? So, a Riemannian manifold is a smooth manifold with a smoothly varying choice of inner products on each tangent space. However, something that is important to, to know and to realize is that a manifold can be endowed with very many different Riemannian structures in the same way that Rn can be endowed with very many different Euclidean structures, okay, different inner products, one for each positive definite matrix. So, the problem, the optimization problem itself, it does not specify a Riemannian manifold. It says minimize F on that set. Now that set may or may not be a manifold, but if it is a manifold, it certainly may be a Riemannian manifold in very many different ways. That is not specified by the problem. So it's for us, for you and me uh, to pick uh, when you design the algorithms. And the metric that you choose is going to have some repercussions on the algorithms that you put in motions. And this is very, for those of you who are familiar with, this is very much akin to the notion of preconditioning um, that is very important in numerical linear algebra. When you're trying to solve very large scale uh, linear systems of equations, for example, but also some other things, then we know that the conditioning of that system uh, can, you know, if it's too large, it can make your life very hard, uh, you know, numerically. So one thing that people do is to precondition, which is what? Well, it's essentially changing the metric, changing the Euclidean metric in the hope that this will somehow um, you know, improve the conditioning of your problem. And, and this is kind of the same here. You can choose the Riemannian metric to try to make your problem nicer. Okay, so that's certainly something that you can do and sometimes you should, 
Uh, but in the practice of it, uh, something that I kind of immediately want to add to this is that in the same way that, yes, in principle, it's nice to precondition when you solve a linear system. Uh, in practice, finding good preconditioners is, is kind of a difficult thing to do. It's, it's a bit of an art. And, um, you know, you can build a career on inventing good preconditioners. Uh, so this is difficult to do. So what happens more often than not is that you don't precondition. You just use whatever metric is convenient to use. Okay, uh, and this is also true for optimization on manifolds. The manifolds that come up in applications tend to be the same, you know, from application to application. And even though the cost function may be different, we tend to use the same Riemannian metrics all the time. Uh, and then sometimes it's interesting to, to switch things around a bit, but, but by and large, we just use the metric that's convenient. Okay, and so this, this is also something to, to keep in mind. All right, now, connecting to that, what, is a convenient Riemannian metric on a manifold. After all, to define a Riemannian metric, you need to pick an inner product for each individual tangent space, okay? Which might sound like a lot of work, uh, but, but there is an interesting particular case where this is very easy to do. And in fact, this you know, would cover most applications, not all of them, but many applications. Uh, and this is a situation where your embedding space is a Euclidean space. All right, so let's take this from the top. We have a manifold M that is embedded in a linear space E, for example, Rn. Now you can turn that linear space into a Euclidean space by picking one inner product, just one inner product on the embedding space. For example, U transpose V. All right, good. Now here's the very simple observation the tangent spaces of M are linear subspaces of E. So we have an inner product defined on all of E. And the tangent spaces are subspaces of E. So certainly I can take that inner product, which formally will be happy to deal with any vectors in E. And I can take that inner product and say, okay, I'm just restricting you to vectors in the tangent space at X, which is a subspace. Well, that's still an inner product, just on a smaller space. And so you can formally define that the inner products on all of the tangent spaces are actually the same, just formally they are restricted to all of these different tangent spaces, but really they're the same. They have the same uh, formula. You know, you would just still compute it as U transpose V in that example. So in one shot, you define the inner products on all of the tangent spaces. And it's not completely shocking that this indeed defines a Riemannian metric. So this is smoothly varying as it should be. And when you pick a manifold, which is embedded in a Euclidean space and you endow it, you equip it with that particular choice of metric, which comes from the Euclidean space, then we call M a Riemannian sub manifold of E. Okay, this is a very particular structure. If you tell me M is a Riemannian sub manifold of that Euclidean space, then you have told me everything I need to know about the Riemannian geometry of that set, all right? And completely this specifies the metric. So just to highlight this, because this is a common confusion in the literature that you may encounter as a reader as well, um, a Riemannian submanifold is not just a submanifold that happens to be Riemannian. It is that specific, you know, Riemannian structure. Okay. Uh, but so, sorry. Yep. Uh, but so, uh... Can we say that a Riemannian submanifold is a Riemannian manifold? Yes. So, so this is this point here. So, okay. right. So, so in order to check that, what you what you would have to do is to say, okay, what does it mean? Let's see. What does it mean to be uh, a Riemannian manifold? Well, we need those inner products to vary smoothly. What does that mean? It means that you should be able to pick any two smooth vector fields and those functions, those functions should be smooth. Now, the exercise here would be to say, okay, let me pick a manifold that is embedded in a Euclidean space, define that inner product to be just the restricted Euclidean inner product and check that those functions are indeed smooth. What does it mean to be smooth? It means that it has a smooth extension. And so the exercise would be build a smooth extension that proves that those functions are smooth. And, and you can do that. This will work. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. Yep. By, by the way, I mean, maybe just as a, a side comment, and I'll put the link again at the end. So the details of all of this, everything, everything I say, oh, that's a, that's a, an exercise or something. You can find all of the, those details. Well, first of all, in any differential geometry book, but but also in the in the my book draft, for which I will put up the, the link again uh, at the end. All right. Okay. All right. Then, okay, so, so the claim is this indeed defines a Riemannian metric. And so uh, together, those things form a Riemannian submanifold. Again, okay, this will come back again because uh, essentially, you know, this is the nicest uh, Riemannian metric to work with. Uh, all of the objects that we need will have a nice expression um, in that metric. Okay, but you can also use optimization on manifolds beyond this case. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it would take some time to go into it. All right. Now we can define gradients. And this is really what much of what we've, we've been doing so far, you know, has led us to, is we want to have gradients because once we have gradients, we can start to imagine defining uh, gradient descent. Right, which would be the very first optimization algorithm uh, anyone would try you know, to, to design, uh, I believe. Now, how does this work? We want to define, you know, if you have a smooth function f on a manifold and it's real valued, <clears throat> you want to define a notion of Riemannian gradient. Now, recall how we define the gradient of a function f bar in a Euclidean space. Okay, we say, it should you know, obey those um, equalities here at the bottom of the screen, okay? Now, we're going to do the same thing uh, for manifolds. Well, just for Riemannian manifolds, it's important. Okay, we'll say, okay, if you give me a smooth function on the manifold, then the gradient will be a vector field, which will denote by grad f, and that vector field is defined implicitly by those relations. Specifically, if you pick any point on a manifold and any tangent vector to the manifold at that point, so a pair xv, then it should be the case that, well, of course, the gradient of f at x is a tangent vector at x because grad f is a vector field. So the gradient of f at x is a tangent vector at x. v is a tangent vector at x. I can compute their inner product with respect to the Riemannian metric at x. That's a real number. And what I want is for that real number always to be equal to this derivative, this directional derivative of f at x along v, okay? According to the definition we had earlier for directional derivatives, okay? But so somehow, and exactly in the same way that we had in the Euclidean case, the Riemannian gradient must be this tangent vector. Well, the Riemannian gradient at x must be that tangent vector at x, which with respect to the local inner product represents the differential of f at x, okay, which is a linear, uh, a linear form, a linear function that is real valued, okay? So that's the definition. And it's a simple exercise to check that grad f is indeed well-defined. There is exactly one tangent vector at x that will satisfy those conditions for all v. Uh, that's easy to show. Uh, it is more complicated to show that if f is smooth, then grad f itself is a smooth vector field. Okay, but we'll just take this as a given. If you differentiate a smooth function, it's gradient vector field is smooth. All right, so that's the definition of the gradient. If I give you a function and I ask, you, you know, compute the gradient, the Riemannian gradient, what you would do is compute those directional derivatives, which you can do with a smooth extension, and then try to massage that expression until it looks like this. And then because the gradient of f at x is the unique vector that has those properties, you would just identify it in, the, in that expression, right? Now, remember how I mentioned that Riemannian submanifolds are very nice uh, and, and all expressions for them are quite easy. Well, this is the case here too. So I do want to mention that because this is what you encounter the most uh, in applications is if your manifold, and this is a big if, okay, if your manifold is a Riemannian sub-manifold of a Euclidean space in the sense we defined, then here's how you can compute the Riemannian gradient. You pick a smooth extension f bar for f. Usually that's what you have 
All right, I mentioned that before. So you have this smooth extension F bar defined on more than the manifold. Compute its gradient in the Euclidean sense, business as usual. Once you have that gradient, it may not be a tangent vector at X. Never mind, just project that orthogonally to the tangent space at X. So proj X is the orthogonal projector with respect to the Euclidean metric from E to the tangent space at X. And this you can check, uh, it's an easy exercise that it will satisfy those, uh, you know, that definition. Okay, so in practice, it's quite easy to compute that object uh, because usually projecting to a linear space is not exactly a, a huge issue. All right. So that's how you would get your hands on the Riemannian gradient. That's how you define it. And that's one way that you might compute it. Now, <clears throat> Riemannian Hessians, uh, that's a more complicated story. Uh, so I'll give you some <clears throat> highlights, but we're not going to get to the bottom of it today. That would take too long. Uh, but I do want to you know, give you a sense of what's going on here. All right, what do we want about the Hessian? Well, in the Euclidean case, sorry. <coughs> in the Euclidean case, the, remind, the Hessian would be what you get when you differentiate the gradient vector field. You have the gradient vector field. And if you look at the directional derivatives of the gradient vector field, which is what we have here at the bottom, that would give you the, the notion of Hessian of F at some point along some direction. Okay, this is what you have here at the bottom. We kind of want to do the same thing on a manifold. We have the gradient vector field. We'd like to differentiate it to get a notion of Hessian. And the Hessian at X should be, that's what we want, a symmetric linear map, a self-adjoint linear map on the tangent space at X. So that if I'm at a point X and I pick a tangent vector V, all right, the function has a gradient at X. And if I move away from X along the direction V, the gradient is going to vary. Now, what I want to know is how does the gradient vary? In which direction? If I move away from X along the direction V, in which direction is the gradient going to vary? And that should also be a tangent vector at X. All right, so you see this correspondence? So we, would, we want the Hessian to be a map that transforms vectors in the tangent space at X into vectors in the tangent space at X. Okay, that's what we want. And in the Euclidean case, we know that we can get that simply by differentiating the gradient vector field. So we say, okay, can we not just do the same thing here? All right, so what is the gradient vector field? Well, it's a map from the manifold to the tangent bundle because that's what all vector fields are, okay? It's a map from the manifold to the tangent bundle, which itself is a manifold. And I mentioned earlier that it's a smooth map because the, the gradient is a smooth vector field. So it's a smooth map from one manifold to another, you know, how hard could it be? Just differentiate it, all right? <clears throat> so we could try to just pick that vector field, differentiate it at X along the direction V and be done with it and define that to be the hash. Now, unfortunately, that does not work. Um, and we're not going to, do, going to go into the details of it, but, but you know, let me just say that the, the way in which it fails is that the result of that computation in general is not a tangent vector. And so if that's what you take as your definition, the output of the Hessian will not be in the tangent space. Uh, and that leads to all sorts of issues down the line. All right. Now there is a way to overcome that, but it requires more work. It re requires specifically introducing a new notion of derivative for vector fields specifically. And that is called a connection. And more specifically, the Riemannian connection is the preferred way on a Riemannian manifold to differentiate a vector field. All right, now you can define that. Uh, there's nothing magical about it. It would just take a little bit of time. Uh, it's not particularly difficult, um, but you know, we're just not going to do it today. Um, but this is something that you, you know, certainly might encounter if you, if you work in this, uh, you know, if you work with such uh, objects. Now, the good news is that if you are working with a Riemannian submanifold, okay, this particular case again, 
then there is a quite simple expression for the Riemannian connection, which when you use it, provides a quite simple expression for the Riemannian Hessian. And what you have to do really is it's quite, you know, intuitive. It's maybe what you would want to do uh, based on that observation from earlier and say, okay, I differentiate the gradient vector field and the result is not tangent. Well, big whoop, just projected the tangent space, right? That's what we did for the gradients. And, and indeed, for the particular case of Riemannian submanifolds, that is the right thing to do. Well, the right thing to do in some very, you know, mathematically well-defined sense anyway. So in practice, if you need to access the Hessian of some function, you compute this Riemannian gradient. We just, you know, talked about how you do that, differentiated smooth extension, projected the tangent space. That expression differentiated again, and then project the result of the tangent space. Okay, this is not the same thing as just taking the Hessian of the, the extension and then projecting, because there's going to be a differential of the projector in the mix. And the, the differential of the projector will capture how the tangent spaces are varying. So it's going to capture, it's going to see something about the curvature, the extrinsic curvature of the manifold. And, and this is actually important, okay? But it's all encoded in that very simple formula. All right. So I, I won't say more about the uh, Hessians. Uh, suffice it to say, in all sorts of situations, this is a perfectly okay object to compute. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, let me not get into the, the details of this um, <clears throat> uh, particular example. Uh, this is, you know, the, you will or already have access to the slides. This is one slide where for a very particular and simple application, namely to minimize what is called the Rayleigh quotient of a symmetric matrix A, on the sphere, how do you go through this you know, list of definitions and computations to figure out the Riemannian gradient of the cost function and the Riemannian Hessian of the cost function? Okay, and so this is it. That's all of it for that very simple application. And I think you know, if you really want to get into uh, optimization on the manifolds and this is your first encounter with it, uh, I, I do recommend that you take some time to look at this slide and go to, through it line by line, map it with the definitions we've, you've, you know, we've been constructing and make sure that you understand why the definition says that this should be so-and-so. Um, and, and this should already give you a pretty good command of what's going on. What I highlighted here is just showing you that you know, this differential of the gradient is not tangent in general. Like certainly the component that is aligned with X is not tangent at X to a sphere. In fact, it's normal, it's orthogonal to the tangent space. Okay, so you can see this here. All right. So finally, we have all of the differential and Riemannian geometric tools that we need at, you know, at the ready. And now we can start looking at designing algorithms, okay, which this is what this is all about. Okay, but there's a bit of a of an technical entrance barrier, but hopefully not too steep. And now that we have those tools, we can say, okay, let's design some algorithms. Um, so how do we do this? Well, I also already sort of spelled the beans, right? All through the presentation. Uh, the, the basic, the cornerstone of all of it is going to be these retractions. And there will be, okay, we'll have to start somewhere. So we'll have to point, pick some point X zero on the, manif on the manifold. But then uh, we're going to iterate a retraction a retraction map like so. You are at some point xk, at the beginning is just x0. The algorithm you're designing will pick a tangent vector sk at xk, okay? That tangent vector you will retract and the result of that will be a new point on the manifold, which we will call xk plus one. And then you just do this again, right? And this will generate a sequence of points uh, on the manifold. Now, as you can see from this expression, everything about the algorithm goes into how do you choose this tangent vector SK? The retraction, by the way, is for you to choose, okay? The algorithm does not choose the retraction for you. You cho choose the retraction. And then the algorithm hopefully will take that into consideration in choosing SK. So how do we choose SK? Well, there are two very simple algorithms we can write in one line on the screen, uh, essentially. One is gradient descent. How do you choose SK in that case? Well, just, you know, you have your function. Compute the Riemannian gradient at XK. That's a tangent vector at XK. 
tickets negative because we want to minimize. So we want a steepest descent direction and the negative gradient gives you that same as in the Euclidean case. Scale it with some real number, some positive real number TK. That's your line search. You know, that's your step size. Um, and for this, you can just use any standard technique uh, to choose your step sizes that you might uh, use in the, in the Euclidean case. All right. And then retract that and iterate. That's gradient descent on a manifold, Riemannian gradient descent. That's it. Another method, also very easy to describe, not so good in practice, but you can make it very nice by adding some, some safeguards to it, is Newton's method. So what does this one do? We'd say, okay, I am at my point xk. And at the point xk, I have a Hessian for the function. Okay, let's assume that this is the case. The function is twice differentiable. So I have a Riemannian Hessian of f at xk. What is that? It's a linear map, symmetric linear map that goes from the tangent space at xk to the tangent space at xk, all right? And what we want is to find a tangent vector sk, so something that the Hessian will be happy to apply to. Okay, so sk will be a tangent vector at xk. And we want to select sk in such a way that when we apply this linear operator to it, the result will be, again, a tangent vector at xk, of course, because that will always be the case. But specifically, we want the result to be equal to the negative of the gradient of f at xk, which again is a tangent vector at xk. All right, so this actually defines a linear system of equations on the tangent space at xk. All right? You solve it, usually using a, a matrix-free algorithm. You don't want to actually build a matrix that represents the Riemannian Hessian. That would be horrible. Uh, typically, what you would use is something like conjugate gradients, the linear version. Okay, the original conjugate gradients, assuming the Hessian is positive definite. You solve this, you get SK, you retract it, you go again, that's reminding Newton's method. Okay. Um, in practice, you wouldn't actually run Newton's method. You would probably run something called trust regions, which is a way to safeguard Newton's method, but let me not get into that. All right. So these are very simple methods that you can uh, you know, intuitively uh, describe in this way and or you know intuitively come up with and very precisely describe in this way and and then you might ask okay um well there's one question which is implementation another question is analysis like how can we understand how these methods behave uh, and we know from the euclidean case that to understand methods such as gradient descent and newton's method a really important object is taylor expansions of f all right so you would have at my point x and I have a direction V in my linear space, and I wanna understand how does F at X plus V compare to F of X? And then you could have a Taylor expansion to tell you exactly what's going on. Okay, well, how, how, what's, the, what's the difference? Um, we're going to do the same thing here on a manifold, except instead of looking at X plus V, we're going to use the retraction at X of V, which generalizes this notion of moving away in the direction V. Okay, so that's the idea here. Um, under some technical conditions that I, I don't want to get into, they are important, uh, but in the end, they do not hurt uh, the practice. So I'm just going to go with those technical assumptions here. Um, you can have a Taylor expansion of F, you know, composed with that retraction in such a way that, you know, if you evaluate F a little bit away from X along the direction S, you will get something that behaves like this quadratic plus a cubic uh, remainder. And it looks exactly what, like what you probably would expect from uh, you know, the Euclidean case. Uh, it's just you know, a zeroth order term f of x plus a first order term in s that involves the gradient, the Riemannian gradient with inner product at x, the Riemannian inner product. And then you have a quadratic term that involves the Riemannian Hessian at x, inner product at x and then some cubic term, where the norm here is the, the norm induced by the Riemannian inner product. Okay, so you have this kind of Taylor expansions, and then you can imagine how, if you have those expansions, then you can study you know, how those algorithms behave, because if you want to know what is the value of f at xk plus one, it's going to be the value of f at the retraction of sk, but the value of f at the retraction of xk is of this form, and so it will compare f at xk plus one to f at xk and it will tell you what the discrepancy is. Okay, so you can, you can study this. Okay. All right. 
Let me skip most of the details here. Um, again, this is something that, that you can uh, check uh, offline if you're interested. This is a one slide analysis of the convergence uh, behavior of gradient descent on a manifold. If you are willing to make do just those two very simple assumptions, one, that the function is globally lower bounded, so the value of the function is bounded below, which I would argue is very sensible in an optimization uh, setup. Okay, it wouldn't really make sense if the value goes all the way to negative infinity. That's one. And then two is that these Taylor expansions of F composed with the retraction, I want them to have you know, the appropriate first order behavior. And then the quadratic term, I'm going to assume is uniformly bounded by a quadratic where uniform, I mean that there exists a constant L independent of X, which you know, puts a limit on how big that quadratic error can be. This is very intimately related to the notion of having a L Lipschitz continuous gradient, uh, which is what you would have traditionally in, in the Euclidean case. Now, if you're willing to make those two assumptions, then what I claim is that uh, the gradient descent method with one over L as your step size, L is this constant, uh, we'll find points where the gradient becomes quite small uh, and decaying as one over root k, which is crazy slow, but is actually the right rate uh, and is, is um, well, optimal for this class of problems. Okay, and the proof is this. Uh, I'm not gonna get into it, but that's the whole proof, nothing uh, missing. Okay, all right. Now let me um, add a few more uh, general words uh, because uh, you know, looking at the clock and we're almost done here. Uh, I wanna add a few more general words um, about you know, the practice of this and, and what uh, might come up in, in, your, uh, in your research as a graduate student, for those of you who are, uh, is that if you actually want to use these tools, optimization manifolds, then it is, uh, I highly recommend that you use some software to help you do that. Uh, I've been developing some software with uh, my colleague Bamdev Mishra uh, and our, our then advisors for a long, long time. It's called Manopt. Uh, we've been mostly working on a MATLAB version, uh, but some other teams have, uh, you know, um, started Python and Julia versions of it, and they they work under the same principle. Uh, these are tools that are that are supposed to make your life a lot easier to actually solve optimization problems on manifolds. The way they work, that a lot of the manifolds that come up are already encoded in there. All the tools you need to work with them, it's in the toolbox. Uh, and then it comes with all sorts of tools that you know, make your life easier to describe the problem, describe the, the gradients and the Hessians, uh, to compute parts of it automatically, check that they're correct, blah, 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 you name it. All right, and so just as an example, for this problem here uh, that I glossed over earlier, minimizing the Rayleigh quotient on the sphere, this is the code you would need in MATLAB uh, to solve it. Okay, just, just these four lines to say, okay, I wanna work on the sphere. This is my cost function. This is the gradient of a smooth extension, the Euclidean gradient. And then, you know, just figure out what to do with that and then call some solver, for example, the trust region method. And you don't even give, give it the Hessian and we'll figure it out. Um, something I wanna highlight about this is that there's a forum uh, where, you know, people, we will actually answer your questions. Um, and I think that's quite important for the usability of the software. So for the MATLAB version, uh, we answer on this forum, but for the other ones, you can ask your questions on the, on the GitHubs. Um, and you can also find a list of other software. If you're not happy with this, you have some other needs. On the about page at the bottom, there's a list of other software by other people uh, you know, that will make your life easier to use these tools. Okay. Um, I do want to mention that this is still you know, a quite active uh, research area. We're always in need of more algorithms. In particular, uh, there are more and more, but it's quite underdeveloped algorithms to handle non-smooth cost functions. And Steve Wright mentioned that yesterday in his uh, presentation, how important non-smooth cost functions have become uh, in the practice of, well, in data science, but other domains as well. Uh, so there's more, but still not enough of that. Uh, stochastics, they don't need to, to convince you of the importance of st uh, stochastic gradient methods. On manifolds, they're a bit tricky. Uh, they've been around since 2013. Uh, Sylvain Bonabel had a, an early paper about that uh, in the time. At the time, since then, there's been more. Uh, but I'm not sure that we really uh, nailed it yet. Um, parallel uh, algorithms, constrained optimization, you're optimizing on a manifold, but there are some additional constraints. How do you deal with that? There's very little research on this. Um, in the end, in the end, all of this is really 
only meaningful if you have good applications for it. There are some old applications that are still in, you know, in need of improvements. There are also some new applications. For example, people are getting interested in, okay, if you have a deep learning architecture, uh, might it be meaningful for some of the layers, for example, to be constrained to a manifold? So yeah, I want to have you know, low rank layers or uh, rotations layers and whatnot. So uh, hyperbolic layers. You'll find papers on all of those examples uh, in the literature. And this is a kind of you know, a burgeoning uh, area. I'm personally very interested also in complexity. Uh, so understanding how well or how poorly algorithms uh, behave, uh, both upper and lower bounds. There are basically no lower bounds at this point, uh, except for one very nice paper of uh, uh, ha Hamilton and Moitra, uh, which seems to show that it's not possible to have accelerated gradient methods, sort of running through all of these to hopefully, you know, just in, if, if you're interested in parts of this, that you might catch some of it. Um, we do not, frankly, understand the role of Riemannian curvature in complexity of optimization at this point, even though the whole point of Riemann, when he developed Riemannian geometry, was to study curvature. And so there's this absolutely central notion, geometric notion of Riemannian manifolds that is mostly absent, uh, not entirely, but mostly absent of our current understanding of optimization on the manifolds. Uh, I think there's something interesting there. Maybe the place where it comes up the most curvature would be in geodesic convexity, where, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, if you're optimizing on a negatively curved space, uh, then you can have a very nice notion of ge geodesic convexity. Uh, and so there, there is a, a lot of uh, ongoing activity as well. Uh, and you could you know, ask, okay, can we go beyond manifolds? Sets that, that aren't globally smooth, but maybe have some kinks here and there, you know, what about those? Now, I am going to finish on one uh, note, which will just take me a, a few uh, cartoon-like uh, slides to, to convey. And, and this is also connecting uh, back to something that Steve Wright mentioned uh, in his lecture uh, yesterday, is the, the importance and the sort of shifting understand, understanding that we have of non-convexity, okay? There's this um, quote of uh, Terry Rockefeller from the 90s, where you know, he made this observation that um, by and large, we understand convex optimization, but not really non-convex optimization. And there was this idea at the time, and uh, somehow maybe still a little bit now, but it's fading, that if you had to draw a frontier between problems we can solve, um, well, I guess this way, problems we can solve and problems we cannot solve, um, then mostly the problems we can solve would be convex, not all of them, but most of them by some measure of most. And non-convex problems are sort of, you know, untouchable. Uh, and of course this, I mean, we, we know at this point, this isn't quite right. And, and the reason for it may be, and you know, just one drawing is that non-convex just means not convex. It just, it doesn't mean hard. It just means, well, it's not convex, but it, it might actually be easy. And certainly there are more and more problems for, for which we identify, we realize now that, well, they're not too bad. We'd call them pockets of tractable non-convexity, right? And this begs the question, where is the frontier? Where is the delineation between problems we can solve and problems we cannot solve? And the reason I'm bringing all of this up uh, right now at the end of this you know, uh, two hour lecture on Riemannian optimization is that, well, there are many different ways of defining what it means for a non-convex problem to be benign, to be solvable, to be tractable. It can have you know, implications of various strength, uh, but something that seems clear, um, or let's say that is puzzling at this time, is that geometry and symmetry seem to play an outsized role in benign non-convexity, by which I mean, and there's this very nice review paper of Jean Kuh and Wright. This is uh, John Wright from Columbia, not Steve Wright. Um, there's this very nice review paper you can find in archive where um, they go over a, a number of works, most of them by the, uh, well, many of them by, by their team, uh, right, rightly so, uh, where they show, look, there's all these non-convex problems um, that you know, somehow one way or another, we were able to show they're not so hard. Um, and what they tend to have in common is that their search space often is a manifold and or 
their cost function has certain symmetries, certain invariances, and there are some group actions. And those group actions implicitly also define a manifold, a quotient manifold, all right? And so it's interesting, I would say, that many of the non-convex problems we now understand happen to be defined on manifolds. And I think there's going to be much more there to explore and to understand in the, in the coming years. Uh, and this is you know, one more motivation to uh, you know, understand these tools and to study them and, and see where they, they can lead us. All right, so with this, I um, you know, thank you for, your, for participating, being my audience. I'm happy to take any questions if, if there's time. And uh, thank you for having me in the, in the summer school as well. Thank you very much for this, uh, this great talk. So if there are any further questions from the audience, we, we do have a few minutes, so feel free to go ahead. Uh, I will have a question. First of all, thanks all for the talk. It was very interesting. It's a very fascinating topic. Uh, yeah, actually, you kind of mentioned it at the at the, at the very end. Like uh, this is actually like this this optimization of manifold carries a promise, which is to step away from convex problems. So far, has there like is there like after building this machinery, then we you presented some preliminary algorithm that in the end uh, resemble a sort of production project uh, uh, gradient descent. But uh, has there been some uh, development already in optimization in manifold that that tells us look there are algorithms and there are uh, kind of problems that sort of carry all the big properties of complex optimization also to some specific case of non-convex optimization for example optimization of manifold like uh, uh, local optimals or global optimals and stuff like that this is something that we see it happening already so, uh, well, are you asking about general principles for this or uh, specific examples? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm asking more, uh, uh, what is the status? Like, uh, are, are, are we already almost there to, yeah. to start to solve things uh, on manifolds kind of reliably? So, um, no, uh, well, let me qualify that. But, but, but I guess the short answer uh, is no. Uh, now, um, well, let me maybe join you. All right. So <clears throat> what I have, okay, what, what I'm trying to, uh, what I should have highlighted uh, here earlier in the, in the conclusion is um, it is exciting that there are non-convex problems, many of them that we understand and they happen to be a manifold, but it's not like I believe and it's not like I think anyone believes that there's going to be some kind of a theorem at some point that says, oh, wait, actually all problems on manifolds are easy. Uh, you know, th this is not going to happen for a number of reasons. One of them is that optimization in Rn is optimization on manifolds, and we know there are plenty of hard problems there, and there is no reason, you know, that magically uh, things should become easier when, when you look at, at broader structures. Now, with this, you know, in mind, um, I'd say I, I would add the following. One is that it may be that there are certain structures that break convexity, but do not necessarily break tractability, and that those structures are best understood with the geometric eye. And what I have in mind specifically here is symmetry. So if you let me give you a, 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 you know, a ridiculous example. If, you, if you're trying to minimize the function sine of x, where x is just a real number, okay, this is not convex, but it's trivial to minimize. Uh, and Part of the reason why, that's, why that is so is, is because uh, the function is symmetric. And so in fact, the fact that the function sine of x is symmetric prevents it from being convex. But you could not have a function, a non-constant function that is two pi periodic and is convex, okay? That does not exist. Um, however, the fact that it's not convex certainly does not prevent it from being simple to, to minimize. Now, in that review paper of uh, Zhang, Ku, and Wright, uh, they, they go into this uh, in, in quite some depth, actually, and they explain, look, symmetry as, you know, structurally breaks convexity. Um, however, when you quotient out that symmetry, you might end up with a problem which is easier to understand, and, and maybe, why not, with a problem that actually is convex. So that would be part of my answer to your question, which is, it may be that if you add some geometric understanding to the problem you're looking at, 
underneath the surface, there is some simple structure. Why not convexity? Although this is maybe not the most uh, common. So that, that's one. And then the other one is this geodesic convexity business where you can have an optimization problem over the positive definite matrices. Now we know that the set of positive definite matrices is convex in the usual sense. But you could have a cost function defined on that convex cone. And that function might not be convex in the usual sense. So you look at that problem and you think, well, you know, this is not convex. So what can I expect? But if you look at it through the Riemannian lens with a different Riemannian metric, and there are a number of interesting metrics you can put on that cone, then it might be the case that your function actually is convex, but in that geodesic sense. Now, Here's something I want to connect then to my slide number zero, which is the optimization problem did not change. It's still the same real valued function on the real set. It's just you change the, the metric, you change the Riemannian structure. And in certain cases, this, this allows you to see, you know, clear as day, oh, wait, this thing actually is geodesically convex. And therefore, you can easily prove uh, all of its local minimizers uh, are global minimizers. Uh, this was already true before you changed the metric, uh, but somehow by changing the metric, it became obvious, whereas it wasn't obvious before. Um, so, so this, I might imagine seeing more of that, you know. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Nicholas, for the very nice introduction to optimization of manifold. I have a very basic uh, question. Can you comment more on this uh, retraction uh, uh, step, uh, uh, as you said, uh, is up to the um, to, um, to the algorithm uh, designer to define the retraction, right? And what I mean, just by looking at one of your examples, it pop out in my mind the proximal operator uh, of an indicator function of a convex set. What is the connection with that, uh, uh, if there is any? <laughs> So, so I, I think um, that would connect best with the notion of metric projection, right? Where metric projection was this uh, special class of retractions uh, where you actually first step into the linear space and then project back to the set. Um, now, we know that projecting to a non-convex set can be tricky. It might not be uniquely defined. Um, so, you know, there are some caveats here, but if, your manifold happens to be the, um, the convex hull or you know, the boundary of a convex set. For example, think of the sphere, which is the boundary of the ball and the ball is convex. Then that projection is, is perfectly well-defined. And I imagine in that case would connect very directly with this uh, proximal operator you, you were mentioning, right? That, that would probably be the, the same thing. Um, so you know, the, the, there is a, a connection there now how many manifolds are boundaries of convex sets or how many useful ones? Uh, th this I don't, uh, I don't quite know, but um, th there might be uh, something. Hmm. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Hi, Nicolas. Thanks for the talk, very nice. Uh, I have one question related to what you were saying in the beginning, uh, the distinction between the problem and the method you used to solve it. And then now at the end, you talked about convexity and non-convexity. Because in normal Euclidean optimization, when you say convex problem, you also think about the feasible set. But if you think about uh, manifold optimization, the, the feasible set is not convex. So for example, what about uh, if a minimum is always a minimum the local minimum is also a global solution or not, or this kind of... Uh, so the, the, the difficulty that I see here is that the, the feasible set is still non-convex. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so many things could not hold even if the extension of the cost function is convex. Right. So, so the, the key here is that you can define uh, both the notion of a geodesically convex function and the notion of a geodesically convex set. And so it's not that you would necessarily need the function to be geodesically convex on the whole manifold, but you might have a subset of the manifold, which is geodesically convex, something you can define. And then if you have a function, which is ge geodesically convex on that geodesically convex set, then 
uh, you would indeed recover this property that the local minimizers are global minimizers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the, these things you, you would recover, but you need both notions. And now um, there's something here that, that I should uh, point out. So the, the reason uh, the, the reason negatively curved spaces, these Hadamard manifolds, positive definite matrices with the right metric, hyperbolic space with the right metric. The reason those are so nice for geodesic convexity is that um, by that definition that you could write down, um, well, oh, all right. So the, the, the manifold itself is always geodesically convex, but on those manifolds, uh, that I mentioned, you can have interesting geodesically convex functions defined on the whole set. Whereas, and you know, it would take a little bit of time to, to make this point more precise, but whereas the sphere as a manifold is geodesically convex, but the only geodesically convex functions on the sphere are constant. So they're not interesting, right? So the only situation you, where you might have interesting geodesic convexity on a sphere is if you look at a subset of the sphere, which is geodesically convex. I, I realize since we didn't define all of these uh, objects, it's probably a bit cryptic, my answer. Um, if, uh, you know, if, if you're uh, interested in, in knowing a bit more, the, the last chapter in, that, uh, in my book uh, is exactly about that. And so in the very early in that chapter, you will have the, the main definitions. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, also given the time, I'm, I'm afraid we have to stop here, but uh, thanks again. It was a very nice uh, introduction and I hope it, in, it inspires many people to, uh, to look further into this, this nice topic. Same. Thank you again for having me. Bye-bye right. everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.